First John 3 and 1, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called his children, and that is what we are. Shout amen. The world does not know us for that reason, nor does it know him. For this is a message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. By this, we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us love in word, not in just word our tongue, but in deed and in truth. First John 4, 7 and 8, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. How many picking up what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. In this is love, but that not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for the perpetuation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Wow. No one has seen God at any time. Oh, that just simply means no one has ever experienced God in his fullness at any time. Throughout the Bible, many have visitations from God. Don't get confused about that. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. And finally, one more little portion. And I want you to catch this as we close this reading and understand that this is our mandate. And we have known and, and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. We ought to be acting like Jesus was acting. There is no fear in love. If you're afraid today, that has to leave today. Amen. Don't put that on your Christmas list. It goes today. You look at me. Some of you are afraid. It ends today. Some of you don't have peace. It's coming today. Unless you want to keep living in torment, now that'd be up to you. But that would not be a good decision. There is no fear in love, but love casts out all fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the suggestion this is the commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also L-O-V-E I'm talking about love come on somebody I want us to understand just before we commit these moments in prayer that if you are not walking in love, you are not walking in God. If you don't love everybody around you, even those you don't want to love, you do not love God. Someone said, uh-oh. Uh-huh. And let me just make this very clear. It's easy to love people lovable. I mean, me, I understand you loving me. That's easy. But you know, Kathy, that's a different subject. Come on now. If she can be mean, no, I better be nice today. Her dad and her mom is in the building. Amen. And I scared of both of them. I ain't scared of hardly nobody, but those two I scared of. I love them so much. Give Joe and Ona Keenan a welcome to the Lighthouse this morning. They're the greatest people in the world. They are the salt of the earth. They are the most precious, wonderful people. If every church could have people like them, and I'd like to just steal them and keep them here. They don't need to go back to Princeton. They need to just stay here and help us. They are the greatest people, and uh, I love them. I want you to love everyone today, and let me tell you something. You're going to make sure, you're going to make sure to hear this word real good. 
if you've ever heard, heard a word, you're going to hear this one. Are you all hearing me tell you you need to hear this? Did you hear me? All right, well, let's throw up both hands in the air. Father, take these moments and anoint them now in the name of Jesus. Anoint them, anoint them with power, anoint them with authority, anoint them with unction, anoint them with power and boldness to speak and proclaim. Today, I want to be your mouthpiece. I want to be your prophet. I want to be your servant. And God, today, I thank you that you're going to do amazing things in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you praise, glory, and honor. Now, I'm so glad you're here today, and I appreciate all of you coming. But listen, God really wants to take a few moments and just change your world and rock your world. Hallelujah. Have you ever had an instant that just said, wow, I'll never be the same after this? And I want those to be one of these moments. I want those to be, this today to be a God-assigned moment. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, well, let's lift up one more great shout to the Lord, everybody. Come on now. Come on now. Hallelujah. As you're seated, love can, be, love can be spelled a lot of ways. I'd like for you to write down four letters, L-O-V-E. This is how I'm going to spell it for you today. I'm going to get into this with the exciting news that I got an announcement to make toward the end of this message that is very, very important. And I want you to get excited about it because I am a good news preacher. I'm only going to bring good news. So if, if I come up to you, you can figure on me bringing good news. Amen. Now watch this. Here's what love is. Love, number one, love is leaving. You may not realize this, but when you love God, there are things you must leave behind. Woo! And when you fall in love with someone, you're going to do some leaving. There are some things that you abandon out of your love. I've been advertising that love is self-sacrificing. Love is living for someone else's good. And I hear a lot of people talk about, well, they did me this way, and they treated me this way, and they didn't talk to me that way, or they said this to me that way. And let me make this very clear. When you get all wrapped up in you, you walked out of the love walk, because love is not about me, it's about him, and it's about them. Come on, somebody. And I hear, I hear people say, well, I just needed me some me time. You don't need enough me time. You've had plenty me time. And I thought about telling you today that you get all the me time you want in heaven, but in reality, heaven's not even your me time. Heaven's his time. You're not going to be thinking about you in heaven. You're going to be thinking about him in heaven. And if you're supposed to be having what's done on earth, it's done in heaven, you ought to be thinking about him more than yourself right now. Love is not about me, 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 me. Come on now. I know a lot of people got eye problem. I'm not talking about this kind of eye problem. I'm talking about the capital I. Me, myself, and I, and we need to get out of that because let me just make this very clear. When you're consumed with yourself, you are walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, and you do not have love in your heart. Well, I have a right to treat them the way they treat me. No, you don't. They said something mean to me, I can't say something mean to, mean to them. No, you don't. Well, they put this on Facebook, I'll put that on Facebook. No, you don't. That is not love. That's not how God teaches us to love. And until we love like Jesus loved us, we do not love. And we love him the way he loved us, and we love others in a self-sacrificing way. Husbands, you ought to love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friend. A love is preferring someone else over yourself. Are you hearing me already? And I know the world has got you, some of you brainwashed and that you think you know what love is. That mess out there from Hollywood and all the papers and all the propaganda, if it te teaches you anything that, that love is about you, it is a lie. It is not the kind of love that God has in mind. And so for you to really step into this love experience, you've got to leave some things. I'm going to show it to you over in Hebrew. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, when God came to Abraham, watch this, to establish faith, to establish faith, the first thing God said to Abraham is, son, it's time to leave. When Jesus went and established his kingdom on the earth, the first thing he said to men, 
He said to Matthew, leave the tax collection booth. He said to the disciples uh, on the seashore, the fishermen, leave your nets. In order for you to come into the kingdom of God, there's going to have to be some things you must leave. And some of you need to really get this in your spirit because you haven't really left yet. You're kind of hanging on. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to confess in the presence of my in-laws, and they may have never known this, but here's what happened when Kathy and I were engaged that year, which was about, it seemed to be about 100 years. We were engaged a whole year, and I, we lived five hours apart, and every other weekend I was working so I could see her every other weekend, and I drove down there, and I went nonstop. I mean, things have changed. I got to pee about every half hour now. But things have changed. Don't ever turn 54. You're going all day long. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Here I go again. Praise God. Hallelujah. But I worked from 3.30 three, from to 3.30, cleaned up in the shop, hopped in the car, and did not get out that car. For, for five hours. And I got her, and, you know, um, we did a little kissing. I'm not going to lie. And I was just hoping, I was trying to kiss like this. I'll be romantic. I'm hoping, man, I hope her dad's not looking out the window right now. Because he'll be in there, click, click, come on. But when it, was, it came time to go, we would kiss over there on um, South Washington Street, and I'd back out. I'd kiss her. I'd back out. I'd get my car. She'd lean over in the car. We'd kiss some more. We were crying. I couldn't leave her. I couldn't. I'd drive. I'd get about, this is what you don't know. I got about, you know where the veterinarian was down just a couple, by half block? I'd get there, and I'd turn around, come back, and I'd go give, give her some more kisses. Did you know that? I, will you forgive me? <laughs> he said, <laughs> Is listen, some of you have that same old love with the world. You're having the heart. One more. Oh, one more for the road. Oh, I love you. You gotta get out of that world. Come on, church. You gotta leave that old that old hateful lover behind. It's gonna ruin you. And some of you can't get that world. Egypt was just like that. They left Egypt, but Egypt never left them. And you gotta declare, I am leaving. I'm leaving that mess behind. I want to just minister something to you for a moment in terms of leaving, what it means to leave. Leave means you turn your back on the way you used to think, the way you used to operate, your MO, the way you used to talk, the way you used to treat people, because some of you, when you're pushed a little bit, you start acting like that old guy. And you've got to leave that old nature behind. You've been given a new nature. And when you don't get your way, you don't act like you used to act. You act like a child of God because you have left that old world. You have bid it farewell. It is in your rearview mirror, and you're not going back for one more goodbye kiss. Come on now. Whew. Why did Lot's wife turn to a pillar of salt? Because she could not leave. Oh, I just, got, I just got to look back one more time. And God zapped her right on the spot because your future in God is always greater than your past in the world. Come on now. So a few weeks ago, I had this epiphany. I had this excitement in the water baptism tank. Somebody said, Pastor, you're just so happy when you baptize folks. If you were in there, you'd have been happy too. Hearing people talking about, well, I used to do drugs. Well, I used to drink. Well, I used to party. Yes, I used to do that. But you know what? It's going to be equally exciting to God. Are you ready? Say, well, I didn't do drugs, but I used to have a big mouth. I didn't get drunk and party, but I sure could gossip. Those sins are just as bad as the drugs and the drinking and the partying and the running around. And you thought I was going to be nice today. Amen. I want to help you with something. That old way of living has to be left behind. When you love God, you're going to leave all that behind you, and you're going to behave differently. Well, I've never been one to apologize. Well, you better be one now. 
I've never been one to shut up. I always have something to say. Well, you can start shutting up and having something to say good today. You can get it. I always just had a snarly attitude. I, oh, you just didn't want my attitude. Well, now you've been given a new attitude in Jesus' precious blood, and you go, you're not obligated to live like you used to live. Somebody ought to jump to your feet. That is good preaching on the last Sunday of June. Hallelujah. Wow. Love is about leaving. Oh, love is about, watch this, it's going to shock you, but it's about obedience. I mean, don't try to tell God how much I just love you so much. I love you, Lord. And all of a sudden, tithe, tithe time comes, offering time comes. I just can't do that. If you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow and keep and obey me. You will keep my commandments. And you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Matthew 22. And you will love God so much that you'll love your neighbor as yourself. On all of these laws hangs all the commandments. Obedience. Obedience. Now, some of you kids, I know you don't know this now. But when you have children, you're going to know this. So it'd be nice if you believe me. Now, I know, I, you know, sometimes I talk to kids and, and, I, and I think to myself, I was pastor church and you are still pooping your pants. I'm going to keep it real today. Don't try to come up and I don't know who you think you're messing with, but I've been lied to more than you've eaten M&Ms. Now, how many know that's a lot of lying? How many have popped a few M&Ms in your day? Come on now. Oh, oh, come on. Okay. Oh, peanut M&Ms. Joy, sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Come on. I always feel like a nut. I've never felt the non-nut phase. Come on. But here's the deal. Don't lie to the man of God. I want to tell you something that you can't tell God you love him and walk in disobedience. That does not work. You can't choose your own path for you. You must follow his path. Woo, hallelujah. Love is leaving. Listen, church, there's just some things you got to just say, I'm never going to get involved in again. It's just, you know, that has been churning in my spirit. There's just some things I am not, because I love this beautiful girl here, I am not, there's just some things I'm not going to do. I'm, I'm not, listen, I'm not, and let me say, say this to you. If you have someone saying they're loving you, and yet they're trying to have a little you know what on the side, that's not love. Come on. And they're trying to play with your emotions and try to run a game on you. You've got my permission to tell them, look out the window. See that curb out there? Go find it. I'm telling you, when you come to the house of God and you're part of the family of God, there's just some things. And I want to get, I want to get this out there. Genesis 22 and 24. When God made Adam and Eve and brought them together, God makes this statement, Genesis 2 and 24. Find it and put it up there if you guys would, please. God said, for this reason, for this cause, watch this, shall a man, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they, this is Genesis 2 and 24, and they, and he shall cleave unto his wife. Is it Genesis 2, 24? For this cause shall a man, let's read it together. So a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall become one. Now, I'm going to make this very clear. Judge Richard Young in Indianapolis declared the Constitution, no, um, the Constitution was not legal by prohibiting marriage between one man and one woman here in Indiana. And so there was a rush on the courts, you know about this, about this. And I don't think you need to be watching any more about it. You know the bottom line. You don't, see, you don't need to be watching men kissing men and women kissing women. That just don't need to get up in your mind and your spirit. So you know what it's about. Uh, find something else. I mean, go to Jake and the Pirates or something. I know about Jake and the Neverland Pirates. Yes, I do. I'm a good papa. I know about, I, I, I know about, you know, hot dog, hot dog, hot diggity dog. I know about that. 
I'm not saying I want to know about it, but I know about it. Find something wholesome until Mickey Mouse starts dating a boy, Mickey. Who knows? And I'm not mad at nobody, but I want to tell you the Bible precedent is this. Let's see it one more time. That a man is married to a woman. A man and his wife. That's all I need to know right there. I don't need to get involved in the politics. I don't need to get involved in all the, all the hoopla that's, separate, that's separating the church and the state and all that. I am just telling you that this is God's eternal word. And he does not change. And this is God's definition of marriage right there. It doesn't have to be, I don't care if America's definition changes. It's God's definition. And that's our story. And we are sticking to it. So love is leaving. And listen, when you get married, you leave mom and dad. And you pay your own bills. And you support yourself. You know, I told my boy, my boys left at 18. I said, y'all ain't coming back. You're big enough, you're full grown men, find a job, pay your own bills. You are not coming back. Keith was my daughter, I let her stay a little longer. But once she left, she didn't come back. I don't want him back. I like the empty nest. It's awesome. Hallelujah. And I'm not getting all the details. I'm just trying to say. So love is leaving. Oh, let's have a little, let's have a little goodbye kiss right now up in here. Come on. You can look, Dad. You, go ahead and look. Because it's been three. Am I still making you mad when I do this? You still having an issue? Look at him. <laughs> I got to tell you something. Those three grandbabies you got, they weren't born in a pumpkin patch. <laughs> I'm feeling my oats up in here. <laughs> v, when you love somebody, you have a vision for them. Write it down. Love is leaving, love is obeying, and love is having a vision. Don't be talking about, well, I don't know where this thing's going. Well, that's, that's not love. I don't have any hope. I don't have any expectation. I don't have any thoughts, dreams, plans, or goals. That's not love. When you fall in love with Jesus, the life of God starts turning in you, and you start getting a vision. A vision defined as this. Write it down. Get it. You're going to be hearing this over the next few months. A vision is God's preferred future. What does God want my life to look like should Jesus tarry then? If Jesus doesn't come next year, what does he want me to look like? And I need to align myself with this vision. The wonderful, famous story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3 tells it well. It talks about Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, said, you are rabbi, your teacher come from God, no man can do the miracles. Verse 3, Jesus makes this statement, and we've always kind of bunched this together. But I want to read verse 3 with you and just quote it to you. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Except a man is born again. Now watch this. He cannot see. He cannot see. He cannot see. You know what? This world's going crazy because they're blind. The blind's leading the blind, and everyone's in the ditch. Can you hear me tell you this? Unless you are born again, you're blind. You cannot see. How many thought when you was a sinner, you were seeing fine until your eyes really got open? You know what I'm talking about. Until that love rushed into you and that amazing grace got a hold of you, you said, ooh, now I know what love is. And until you get born again, you cannot see. Now, what's the next verse? Verse 5, he, and Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born again? So, you, you know, and Jesus said, marvel not, marvel not. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter into I always thought that was one thought. Well, unless you're born again, you're not going to heaven. No, first of all, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of heaven. And then if you're not born again, not only can you not see it, you cannot enter into it. And so you've got to have a vision. You've got to get a hold. And I want to ask some, some of you this. When's the last time you put thought and meditation and prayer into your preferred future? What God wants my life to look like. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Let me finish up by saying E. When you love somebody, you're going to have enthusiasm about that. I'm telling you, if I'm doing a little reminiscing, I probably fell in love with my wife. She wasn't my wife then. She was just a cute little girl I was flirting with, like I flirted with a bunch of others. I'm not going to lie. 
But I've left that past. I'm, I've left that past. That's not me no more. Come on now. And you know that's true? I'm still alive. Ain't no frying pan stuck up in my head. Come on. And I'm just telling you, I'm going to just say this real clear. Some of you are still struggling with drugs. I feel that in my spirit. I'm going to give a prophetic word. You're going to remain struggling until you get desperate enough to reach out and call me and let us get you help. You're not kicking this on your own. You need to know that. And you're here today. Some of you are still, you may have been, you may be high this morning. I do not know. You may be all sick on that mess today. That is hell in a bottle, hell in a needle. And Jesus has come to give you heaven and take away the hell out of your life. And you need to give us a call and we're going to get you free. We're going to get you delivered. Come on, church. And it was in Springfield, Missouri. I was sitting at a table, and I've always told people this. Our first date was a hit. Our first date was off the chart because she did what she loved, and I did what I loved. She loved to talk, and I loved to eat pizza. And so she was too busy talking. I said, you want that slice? No, nah, go ahead. She kept telling me stories about it. I had never known her. I knew she kept telling me, but it was, and I said, oh, you want that slice? I mean, I bought a big old pie, you know, and but about two hours later, she had kept talking, and I kept eating pizza. It was a marriage made in heaven. Hallelujah. And some things haven't changed in 36 years. Amen. But what encouraged, what, what, what I fell in love with was her zest. Let me tell you something. I ain't going to have none of that. Well, I guess I love you. You know, I'm just, I'm just not sure. I'm just, yeah, I love you, but, you know, I just, uh, I want somebody who loves me to be excited about it. You know, what does Jesus say looking down our church and we're sitting there with our hands? Okay, oh, Lord, okay. Help me, Jesus. I'm going to be nice. Oh, oh okay. We're, we're sitting there, we're singing, you know, I sing, I dance before you, Lord. We're just sitting there. I'm tired. You think Jesus was tired by the time he went to Golgotha and got beat? time they shoved thorns in his brow and they opened his back with a cat of nine tails 39 times he was bruised and sped up on and hit you think he may have been tired but he cried out it was finished and I know we're tired but we're not so tired of God doesn't deserve our praise hallelujah Amen. We're not so tired of God doesn't deserve our love. And we can get enthused about Jesus once again. We need to get back to some good old-fashioned joy. For the joy of the Lord was my strength. Make a joyful noise in the Lord. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Well, one more time, jump to your feet at Lighthouse. Come on. You ought to give God some enthusiastic love right now. It don't matter if you're tired. He's worthy. I want to make an announcement. I want to go back and visit the letter V just before I stop preaching. I'm going to lay out to you, and I want everyone to look at the screen. I'm going to lay out to you the schedule of what the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months is going to go. It, there is a Habakkuk 2.2 verse that says, you shall write down the vision, you shall make it plain, and you shall run with it that reads it. And I want to give you the schedule. Next week, we're having the Blood of Heroes. You know about that. The following week, we're having missionaries, Diane and um, Randy McGahee. We're talking about having those friends that were in, we visited in Italy. And then we're going to come back right after that. Do we have a schedule ready to go? That's fine. Um, July 20th, and we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about um, this event called the Blessed Life. If you've ever been involved in the Blessed Life series, shout amen. It's going to be the Blessed Life series live. It won't be on video. It'll be live. And I'm excited about our special guests that will be there that day. And, and um, then, then we're going to move into a series on vision. On vision. Did you know that in five short years, we're going to hit a monumental mark, the year 2020? How many know when you go to the eye doctor and he says your vision is a certain number, you know you're not needing these? 
You don't want to hear 20, 100. You don't want to hear 2,200. You don't want to hear 25,000. You want to hear what? How many here without glasses have 2020? You all praise God every day. You all bless God every day. Sometimes I get, I got pretty good vision with or without. Sometimes I just get a little tired of messing with these things because I sweat and it gets get all messed up. And I didn't realize that I was so greasy. You get mowing, you get working, you know, your hair comes down to your glasses. No, I don't have that problem. But I will be sharing God's, listen to me, on September the 14th, shout September 14th. I will be sharing God's preferred vision. This is going to be the most aggressive, exciting vision for the next five years. We are going to be setting in motion the reality that however God has been faithful in the past, that he will be more faithful and he will outdo himself in our future. This monumental, aggressive, assertive initiative has been birthed in several months of prayer. Are y'all hearing me? And this is going to be called the 2020 vision. And I was praying a few months ago and I said, God, what do you want this church to look like in 2020? And he said, what do you want your church to look like in 2020? And I understood what he was telling my heart. He was telling me that I am the one and we are the ones who get to say if the vision he has given us comes to pass our stalls. Because he has given us a vision and if we will roll up our sleeves, we will see our 2020 vision come to reality. Now, let me tell you this. Not only is the church going to go into a 2020 vision campaign, your family, your marriage, your finances, your life, your health, your victory is going to move into attack mode, and you're not going to be the same in 2014, 2015 as you were when you began this journey. And I'm going to ask you to begin to pray and see God's face about what you want God to accomplish in you by the year 2020. Now, let me tell you something. Are y'all listening to me? There's gonna be millions of multitude people if Jesus tarries is coming. They're not gonna look any different except more wrinkles and less hair or gray hair than they did last five years ago. And they're going to sit by and watch someone else get the victory, watch someone else get prosperity, watch someone else get success, watch someone else walk in breakthrough. And they're going to sit by and point fingers and cause problems and run their mouth, but they're going to be the same. And if they're going to be the same, it's not going to bother me. I'm going to love them, but I'm not going to be the same. And this church isn't going to be the same. And I'm going to tell you that we are going to set in motion some aggressive goals and plans because we are preparing should Jesus Terry, to pass this church on to the next generation. And when we do, what do we want them to get in the kind of church that we have created for them? Come on, somebody. It's called the 2020 vision. Let's stand to our feet. Let's, let's raise our hands. Father God, now in the name of Jesus, we give you glory. We give you praise. Come on, everybody, begin to lift your voice. We thank you. We honor you. We adore you. We praise you. We worship you. You are a mighty God. You are a great and wonderful King. And Lord, come on now, somebody enthusiastically give him glory and praise. We'll be leaving our past, obeying his voice, trusting his vision, doing it with enthusiasm. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I wish somebody would shout out. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Oh, God. Out of my love for you, Lord, I will praise you. Out of my love for you, I will give you honor and glory. Thank you, Lord.
A moment ago, I spoke to someone who's dealing with drug addiction. Would you raise your hand if that's you? Where are you? You're dealing with it right now, and it's winning in your life. Come on, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You've done illegal drugs this week. I know you're here. Somebody pray. Somebody pray. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but I want to tell you something. God's given a word to you. Is that you? Did you raise, are you raising your hand, honey? Is there someone else? Okay. Someone else? She was just praying. Someone else? Say, Pastor, pray for me. How many drank at least one alcoholic drink last week? Raise your hand. At least one. At least one. Let me tell you something, guys. You don't need that. That's in your past. That is in your past. Well, I always had a beer. Well, you're not, you're not that person anymore. That is in your past. Could I get a shout at amen about that? It's in your past. Break it. It doesn't have a hold on me. Okay, then prove it. I ask the same question next week. You shouldn't raise your hand. If it doesn't have a hold on you, you don't have to do it then, do you? Every guy, every, everyone just raise your hand. I put it up again. Father God, I rebuke. Come on now. I want all those folks to raise your hand. That's a part of your past, and you know I'm telling the truth. That's a part of your past. Now, God, right now, deliver, deliver, deliver right now. No more beer, no more drinks, no more strong liquor. In the, take that out of them. I pray that that's not a part of their lives anymore. And if people won't accept them because of that, then that so be it. They got a true family and friends right here. Amen. Amen. Well, we love you. Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus Christ one more great hand of praise? Amen. Well, today is a great day. We get to celebrate, well, if you're like me, two of the most important people in our lives. And they're so special, spe celebrating 26 years of ministry here at Lighthouse. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, if you think about, well, why do we, why do, we do this today? It may seem obvious, and, and it really is. It's important that we do this. Think, if you look at your calendar, you see all kinds of special recognition days on there. We celebrate Secretary's Day, Boss's Day, Grandparents' Day. we got birthdays, anniversaries. Well, if we can celebrate all that, we can celebrate two people that have been pastoring and making an impact in this community and in all of our lives. We can put a date on the calendar to do that. So it would be hard for all of us. We'd love to have the time to give everybody the microphone, let you say a whole bunch of words about how much you love and care for them and how much we appreciate them. So we're going to take 20, 30 minutes here and try to just express it as condensely as what we can and make sure that they know how much we love and care about them. Um, sometimes that's a problem that we have. We have a tendency to take people in our lives that are very significant to us and forget to thank them. And a lot of times we come in here on Sundays particularly and we'll come in and there's so much that's happening, so many programs and classes and all these things that have been put together and many people don't have any clue what went on Monday through Saturday to make that happen. Uh, but there's a lot of behind the scenes and the ministry is of course a, a team and a partnership but we've got to have great leaders to pull it off. And Lighthouse is making a huge difference in this community, right? We would all agree with that. So now as I think about, and I want to share with you just a couple quick things that I personally appreciate and value about Pastor and Kathy, and I'm sure that you can maybe relate and maybe you could add some things to it yourself. But when I think about Pastor and Kathy, one thing that comes to mind is the word talent. Very, very talented people. Now as God's people, when things are going good or we have good gifts and abilities, we always give God credit for it, right? We don't get, you know, we don't get arrogant and egotistical and think we're, we're great because of this. So as we brag on them today a little bit, they recognize already uh, how amazing they are through what God has gifted them with, but they work pretty hard at this as well. It's not like God just dropped this on top of them and all their gifts and talents. Uh, he, he blessed them with it, but they work hard to nourish these things and to nurture them and to make them great in their life. But when I think about pastor, you think about uh, the many, many uh, sk great skill sets that he has. I have always been impressed by his great organizational abilities. We've all heard of the to-do list where he draws, takes the ruler and crosses things off. 
right? I have a nice to-do list too, but I've never taken a ruler to it. Uh, but I probably should, probably should. I mean, his organizational skills are amazing. He's very talented at that. Um, I also think about, you know, the ability to remember people's names. Uh, a lot of us struggle with that, and I'll see him every week, you know, greeting people, and I'm thinking, man, how did he remember their names? They just visited last week, and Kathy, too, with that. Um, you know, their leadership characteristics, you know, just all the many things that he does, and, and particularly one that really sticks out with Pastor as being, you know, working in his Timothy group and with all the other people in there. But the way that he can give you some very spot-on advice has always impressed me. Has anybody else ever been on the opposite side of the desk and maybe you were in a very tough spot? And what I've always noticed is that it doesn't take him too long to come up with the advice either. It doesn't take, uh, he doesn't have to study it and pray about it too long. He's been studying the Word and he's been involved in our lives enough where he can usually get us some advice pretty quickly. And I know for me, several times in my life where that advice has really made a big difference. So those are great things. And you look at Kathy and you think, you know, she is the multitasker, tasker extraordinaire. Uh, I've never seen anybody balance as much stuff as she gets going. She's got all kinds of projects and things that are happening. And she has this very unique ability to coordinate and plan and put events together. You know, you women know how awesome the women's event is and all the preparation with that. She's great at, uh, you know, bringing other people in and giving them responsibilities. Look at our CE, our life groups. I mean, we could go on and on with just some of the very basic personal characteristics, personal skills, talents that they have. And we know we're very blessed with a couple of very talented uh, pastors in our life. But what I want to add to that is that really, at the end of the day, regardless of how organized they are, regardless of these little skills that they have, at the end of the day, what we really value them for goes far beyond all of that stuff. It goes far beyond all of that. Could they be great pastors and ministers without some of those skills? Perhaps, I'm sure that there's some that are, but those make them even better. But really what we value the most about them when I think about their life, number one, I think about their deep prayer life. I don't know that you know this, but working with pastor close enough for many years now, they are praying regularly for each of you. I mean, and as I've always thought about that, I've challenged myself and thought, who else in my life prays for me as much as my pastor and Kathy? You know, even, you know, your family certainly is praying for you, hopefully every day. But sometimes you begin to think, do I really have that many people who care enough about me where every week they're, they're praying for me? They're calling my name before the Lord. They're praying for my family. Uh, I've rarely brought something to pastor, maybe with the men's minister, where I said, hey, I want to tell you about the struggle this guy's having or whatever. Rarely have I done that and he didn't already know. They're so deeply involved in people's lives and they are, they are praying for you very regularly and hopefully you can feel that and hopefully you're reciprocating that back to them as well. And I think about, secondly, Kathy's heart with connecting people and, you know, a lot of churches are not great at that, but here we have a church where we are we are, what did we say, a thousand yesterday joy bottles? That makes 2,000 this year that we've got out. We are connecting people. Kathy leads the charge with that. We're building great relationships in the church. Our life groups have been, you know, just phenomenal this last go around. So those are things that are, that are huge. And um, one other thing with Pastor, I think about what I would describe as his almost inability to give up on somebody. That probably above everything else has impressed me more than anything because I'll sometimes have that tendency, like a lot of you, to you see somebody who's checking out or not doing a great job, you kind of want to give up on them and just say, well, hey, you made, you made your bed, you got to lie in it. And I've seen him just wholeheartedly chase after people, you know, emotionally and sometimes physically, just go get them and bring them to church and care so deeply about them. I mean, it's as if he just cannot refuse, like when Jesus talked about that shepherd that went after that one, right? So the pastor works like that, and the words that we get even today and every, every Sunday, the word that we get preached, Holy Spirit's job is to anoint, but the Holy Spirit will much more likely anoint a sermon that has been planned and prepared, right? When someone has put some work and heart into it and prayed over it, then the Holy Spirit will have an easier uh, opportunity to come in and anoint it. And these are the things that are making the difference. And at the end of the day, what we are most concerned about and what they're most concerned about is the souls that are now going to be, that are already in heaven, or that one day will be as a result of their efforts. So let's watch a quick video and, and hear a little bit about that. Pastor 
Pastor and Kathy, 26 years, who would have believed it? I am a lover of God's Word because of your ministry, and for that I will be eternally grateful. The times that I have, uh, I have failed and fallen, you, have all, you both have always been right there to pick me up, dust me off. I will follow your ministry all the way up to the pearly gates. I was here at Lighthouse when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was baptized in water here and received the Holy Spirit here and also was healed here. Since I've been here, I have purpose and I have hope and I have my life back. I am very thankful for Pastor and Kathy. Yeah, I was baptized and saved here uh, at the Lighthouse. We both were. We would just like to thank Pastor and Kathy being a guidance in our life and being there whenever we need it. Well, thank you for everything you've done for not only Ryan and I, but also my our daughter Colleen and the great kids. We really appreciate everything you guys have done for us and our family. I mean, you really brought a lot of joy to our hearts and we really appreciate it and we do love you guys. And we just want you to know you're a big part of our family and want to be a big part of your family. We know that this is where we need to be, and we just love you very much. You're really, really appreciated in our lives. When Tisa, our daughter, brought us brought us in, the love and support that's here is just, it's just immeasurable. I've come to be more peaceful since my passing of the, our daughters. The, uh, the biggest thing is, is my life has really been more complete now, and I've overcome a lot of my fear of the future and it's really helped me kind of peace with myself and I just really appreciate everything they've done for me. About three years ago when we moved here, I think the scariest part was uh, coming to a new church, having no family, not knowing anybody and from the very moment we walked in the doors, um, it was warm, it was welcoming. Uh, listening to the pastor's sermon and just the way he conducts himself and the way the church is, um, his staff around him, it's just, uh, it's obvious that not only, not only does he care, but um, the love just flows through him. And, and it comes to the people that work under him and the people here you can just feel God's presence every time. But as soon as we came here the first time, we knew this would be our church. It has been an answer to so many prayers, just, just from the first time we walked in, we knew. And I think even, sure. even in our personal walk and our growth and our development, our pastor just challenges us daily. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have grown so much closer to God through them. Mm -hmm. and, and just the experiences we've had and the miracles we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't ask for more. Thank you. We love you guys. I love you guys. Hello, Pastor and Kathy. I had the privilege of meeting you in late 2010 when you were ministering to um, a patient at the local hospital. Um, I rededicated my life to Christ during an Easter production in 2011, and I've been a member of your church since October 2012. I want to say thank you for everything that you've done and for welcoming me with open arms and all of your support and encouragement along my journey. Uh, Pastor and Kathy, I really thank you guys for yeah. being, here, being here for me all these years. I know I was here before you got here, but I really was appreciated when you guys got here and took this church over. A lot of building in this church together, and I hope to be here many more years. I just love you guys. March the 4th, 2004. This is my spot. This is the very spot I got saved in right here. Zach Holderman was preaching, altar call. I came and gave my life to God. The world is full of superheroes. Pastor Kathy, you guys are mine. Without you guys, I'd be that same drug addict, alcoholic whole ball of wax. But with you guys, I found a God that I can love for the re who loves me as well as I can love him for the rest of my life. And I'm so thankful to have you guys, not just in my life, but my kids' life as well. I'm home at Lighthouse. I can't be nowhere else. 26 years. I have purpose. The love just flows through him. The love and support. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. We love you guys. I just love you guys. Thank you so much. Roof to you, big dog. Yeah, amen. Great, and I'm sure each of you can kind of remember your spot too, and we all have a, a special place here 
where we have given our hearts to the Lord or rededicated our lives, and we thank you so much for that. Now, we have a couple of special guests here with us today, uh, Kathy's wonderful parents, Joe and Winona Keenan. If you guys will come on up for a minute. They prepared to tell us a lot of real bad stuff about Kathy when she was growing up. Come right on up here. What's that? That's perfect. All right, there you go. Well, he asked us if we would say a few words. So, Ralph, it's my turn. Ah! Oh. Go. Uh, Kathy was at Evangel College when she met Ralph. And we had been to Evangel one time and met him there. We lived in Effingham, Illinois, and we were in the process of moving to Princeton, Indiana. We had sold our house. My husband had left and went to Princeton, and my two sons and I were staying in a camper because we had already sold our house. God sold our house for us. But Kathy called and said, Mom, I want to bring Ralph home for the weekend. I thought, oh, great. Here we are in a camper that's just barely big enough for three of us. But I said, okay. So I talked to a friend and she said, well, you and Kathy can come and stay at our house and the boys can all stay at the camper. So that's what we did. Well, that Sunday night, they left to go back to Evangel. And we were sitting in church and they came and got my husband and he had a phone call. It was Kathy. Dad, we're, I don't even remember where, somewhere in Missouri, and Ralph got a ticket. He got a speeding ticket. And Dad, we don't have any money, and they're not going to let us go until we pay for the fine. So he had to leave church, go wire money. I know, I thought it was good. But we love this couple very much. They're very precious to us. Um, they came to us and said that they were going to come to Richmond, Indiana, and they were living in Princeton. And we were not very happy about that because they were bringing our three grandbabies up here, and they were very young. And that was part of our life, and they still are part of our life, but it's hard when they're four hours away. And so we missed a lot of their activities and the things that we would love to have been a part of, but we know God was in it. You see, when it's a God thing, it advances. It gets better when it's a God thing. And sometimes we don't think it's God's will, but when we wait and let God do his thing, we find out if it's God's will. And I know this was God's will. Because when they came here, there was a very small church. Then you added on once, and now you've added on again. And that's a God thing. Advancement is from God. Getting better is from God. And all I can say is to God be the glory. Great things he has done. And I thank you for loving them, for respecting them, and for honoring them. I know what a pastor's life is like because we have three pastors in our family. And it's not an easy life. I used to think... Oh, the pastor's got it made. All he does is talk on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. That's what I thought. But that isn't true. They may not even get to bed and somebody calls them with a problem. One thing I would like to advise you, and you may already do this, I don't know, but I know a pastor appreciates a phone call that says, thank you, I love you. I'm praying for you today because most of the phone calls they get are problems. So it's kind of nice just to say thank you sometimes. Thank you for listening to me. I know some of y'all are sitting there scratching your head 
wondering why in the world pastor preached on love. Well, somebody told him his father-in-law was going to get to talk. So, <laughs> you know. No, I want you to know, son, I love you. Like Winona said, this ain't just a thing. This is a God thing. You know, some pastors, oh, hallelujah, there's a church I can come to. And they go. Some pastors are called from God. These two kids were called from God. This is not what they come to. This is what they come for. You know, when this long-haired hippie come to my house, <laughs> I sent that beautiful baby off to school, and she picked up this roadside hitchhiker. I don't know. <laughs> I thought this, I thought, God, you're really using that girl. She might get that old boy saved. <laughs> but then a little farther along, she come and said, Dad, I'm going to marry that. <laughs> it's been tr I thought, Lord, what did they do to her? <laughs> you know? But then, finally, I got to where I could say, oh, I love you. <laughs> took a while. Bless you. <laughs> took a while. <laughs> and then God was so gracious that he gave them three babies, uh -huh. my grandkids, my first, and especially that one. I thought, wow, I'm so happy. And then he comes to me. And he says, we're moving to Richmond. We're taking the kids. I said, no, you move to Richmond and leave the kids. <laughs> but then I thought, okay, I'll fix you, big boy. I won't even speak to you anymore. Just go up there. God has a way. Laying in the emergency room and Evingham, or, yep, Evansville, I'm sorry, Evansville, God said, you might get out of the way and let my kids do what I called them to do. And now I look and see, if they would have listened to me, would have stayed where they was at, would have kept my grandkids where they were at, Richmond, Indiana would have had a whole lot of people going to hell today instead of heaven. I can look out and see beautiful people, but now I tell you, to me all of you are not perfect, but when these two come to my house, and start talking about Lighthouse, you'd think you was a bunch of angels, you know what? <laughs> I thought, hey man, I've been to church all my life, people ain't like that. No, they love you. Not just because who you are, but what you're gonna be. I don't know how much, how big this is, place is gonna be, but it's gonna be packed huh. if God allows it. And one other thing I wanna tell you, God puts this on my heart, and I, I just can't get it off. People look at Winona and I, and they say, Oh, you're so blessed. A man stopped me on the road the other day and was talking, and he said, uh, You build a new life center? And I said, Yeah. He said, The Baptist church are building one. I said, Yeah, that's my son. He's pastor there. Oh, really? I said, Yeah, my other son's pastor in Evansville. Really? Yeah, and I said, my daughter and my son-in-law are pastor. He's all, come on. I didn't even have time to get to my grandkids. Nothing Winona and I did to do that. But there's a man in the Bible that was at church all the time, I pray, a priest. And he said, God told him, you're not going home until you hold the master in your hand. He went and he blessed all the kids 
day after day. But when Mary brought Jesus in, he said, that's the one. He held his hands out and he said, can I hold the child? They led that baby in his arms. He said, now I'm ready to go home. Moms, dads, take that baby. If it's that size or if it's 40 years old or older, if it's on drugs, if it's not on drugs, lay that baby in them arms. Come up here. Lay that baby on that altar in your mind. And I can guarantee you, God will take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. Wow. We got a little extra for that. Thank you guys so much. Pastor has been called a lot of things, but not long haired for many years. So that was good. And we were short on time or we'd go through the other laws you've broken, but we didn't got time to get into that. All right. We have our uh, other deacons and our wives come up and present Pastor and Kathy with a couple of gifts. Pastor and Kathy, come on up here with us if you would. Oh, they were probably both angel kids. I'm sure nothing could have even been said. But we love you guys so much. We want to uh, have Dwayne come up first. And Pastor, we just wanted to, uh, on behalf of the deacons, just give you a small gift. Um, it's not hair supplies. So, <laughs> but we do love you, and, and, and we do appreciate everything you do for us. Yeah. You and John walk up here for a minute and stand. <laughs> we ain't that kind of church. <laughs> oh, thank you guys for your thoughtfulness. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Barbie and Jim. Kathy, this is um, from the deacons and the wives. It's just a small token of our appreciation for everything that you do and the vision that you have for the women of Lighthouse and the, the, the women of Indiana, and you're going to knock it out of the park because that's what you've been called to do, and we thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, one of the things, and sometimes at little events like this, people get things said about them. They're like, well, I wish you didn't need to say that. You didn't need to say that. But I, but I want to say this is that one of the things, and this is one other gift we want to give you, but one of the things that is very special and unique about Pastor and Kathy that I'm sure most of you have, have gathered at some point or another. And you remember a couple years back, we, we sent them on a sabbatical. No sabbatical this year. Don't get excited. Don't get excited. We're working on the plans for a deacon sabbatical, so we'll let you know how that works out. But these two work tirelessly. I mean, they work so hard. I mean, ministry, not ministry, they're just simply two of the hardest working people that I've ever encountered, and these guys would all agree. I mean, they work so amazing. And one of the things they have a, uh, a hard time with is, is leaving the church and getting out and getting the rest sometimes that they need because they're, they live and breathe this. Like, like Joe said, this is just, this is them. So it's difficult at times, and you may, you may not have even caught this, but normally there's a pretty good break they take after Easter. That didn't get to happen, and summer vacation a little postponed. and It's hard for them because they're so busy and so involved in what they're doing, and they, they, it's hard to get out. So one of the last gifts we want to give you is we want to give you a little getaway. We want to give you an opportunity to make sure that you get, get a little bit of a break. So we've asked them to just, we're going to let them work out the details, kind of plan the when and the where. But as a church, we wanted to make sure we supported them and took care of the expense for a few day getaway for them. So not, not a few, not another six weeks or nothing, but take, we want them to take a few days. And as you're praying for Pastor and Kathy, please pray for that. Pray that they'll have rest and relaxation. They'll be able to recuperate too. So we want to include a gift there for you to take care of that. And we'll, if you guys will take those things from them, we want them to come up and just, just come up and share your heart with us just for a few minutes. And then we want to spend a few moments in, in prayer for you. So, yeah, who's first? Um, you, talk, you talk and somebody bring me some pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, 
on a journey. I can tell you that we serve an amazingly faithful God. And um, he puts it all together. I hope you get that. I hope, you know, the, the comments on the videos are amazing and testimonies and my parents sharing and looking back and seeing the things God has done are amazing. But please know it is him. And if you will get that in your spirit, if I serve him with everything in me, you cannot lose. You cannot lose. And God is so amazing and so faithful. I have to say this just because this is like icing on the cake for, for me. This morning, we each received a text message from Tim and Teresa Smith who regretfully couldn't be here this morning because they're in Florida enjoying their grandson's first Sunday in church, which is awesome. But what's so awesome about that is 26 years ago, when Tyler Smith, that baby's daddy, had his first Sunday in church, it was our first Sunday. Think about that for me for a moment. 26 years ago, when we came to Lighthouse for the very first time, Tyler Smith was carried in as less than a week old infant. And this morning, he carried in his son on our celebration of 26 years. Is that amazing? I sit back and go, God, how in the world did you plan that? How in the world do you do that stuff, Father? God is awesome. I love all of you so much, and thank you for the people that you are, for the people you're becoming. And um, I've been talking to people lately, and it's amazing that we are here in all different levels of, um, you know, you all didn't start with us 26 years ago, and then there's those who have been here for the last 12, 15, whatever, and there's some of you who've been here for less than a month. And we have all of you here. And every one of you are vital, and every one of you matter. And God has an amazing future for each of us. And um, I'm so glad we get to share that together. And I'm look f looking forward to the awesome things that God has ahead and um, the kingdom that he's growing. When my mom said, this isn't what, or my dad, somebody just said, this isn't what it was, um, 26 years ago, there were 35 of us. <laughs> and um, God's given us this city. And I love all of you. And you are all part of fulfilling me. But this is not enough. <laughs> and we are just getting started. And you are part of the plan. And that 2020 vision has your name written all over it. And I am so looking forward to the plan that God has. Thank you, honey. We do appreciate more than you'll ever know your kindness today. Appreciate the fact that our deacon leadership team has worked hard to coordinate this, the videos, the thoughts, uh, bringing in my wonderful in-laws and the kind things that all of you have done. We appreciate and thank you deeply. Thank you deeply. Um, you know, we have a greatest group of deacons and their wives. Could you say God bless you to them? They're just so precious. Our, uh, you know, our wonderful, our wonderful support staff of Lisa Clevenger. She's a jewel to work with, and and Larry and Helen. They're precious, great people. Um, always there for us. Our daughter-in-law Kristen, and you know, our administrative assistant Angie. And she's just a blessing. We thank God for our pastors, Pastor Josh and Kristen, Pastor Dylan and Keila, our deacons, and all of you. You're, you're very, 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 very much loved. I want to just say this. <clears throat> when we came 26 years ago, the Lord, the name of the church had just been changed from Faith Assembly to the Lighthouse Assembly of God. And when I was back in Princeton preparing to come here, the Lord said, you need, to bring a, you need to bring a slogan, a 
phrase, but more than that, a foundation, and that is where love shines. And I was here just a week or so after we got here, and I was preaching a 27-year-old. I had lots of hair then, but it was saying goodbye. It was on its way out, you know. But I had more. But the point is, um, I said, well, our church is going to be called Where Love Shines. And it's interesting, 26 years later, today I'm still preaching about love. And let me make this very clear. I love you, and Kathy and I love you. We will always love you. We love you with a depth that you may not even believe. You may not think that I'm telling the truth. But the truth is this. I and she loves you all very much. And here's how you know we love you. We don't want you to stay the same. Was my mother-in-law's words about, you know it's God when it advances, that was a good word. No, the, the speeding ticket part could have been left out. But that part was, of all the stories. So you want to know about that? So he's, he's, in, the, he's in my Red Ranchero. <clears throat> no seat belt laws, and it was, there was one huge seat. And when it, she and I went down the road, she sat so close to me, you could have fit three or four more. I mean, it was like... And so we were driving down, I think it was Interstate 44, and, and I was holding her, singing to her, I love you just the way you are. And that was... <laughs> and um, singing, just, we were so in love. So I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, what my foot was doing down there. It was getting heavy. And all of a sudden, yeah, and the guy said, you come back with us to the jail. And if you don't get the wire, money wired tonight, that's where you're staying. They wouldn't accept a check. Then we had like four bucks, you know. And I, I then after, guess what? After we called him, I had to call my dad and said, Dad, Kathy's dad wired us money for a speeding ticket. Would you send him the money tomorrow to reimburse him for my ticket? And my dad said, yeah. But we love you. We love you all so much, and we appreciate your kindness. You got time for one more story? <laughs> so I was at the minister's um, prayer summit, and they put this chair in the middle. All these pastors are sitting around, and the chair is called God's lap, and you go sit on God's lap, and you begin to pray. You pray to God what's on your heart. And oftentimes my heart breaks because the National Day of uh, Past Appreciation is in October and we do ours at the anniversary. These guys always set it up. I have nothing to do with it. They do amazing. Uh, but ours is in June and so we've always felt appreciated. You'd be surprised. The pastors who weep in that chair and said, God, another, another year has come and gone and no one thought to do anything for Pastor's Appreciation Day. Not one card, not one gift, not one note, not one thought. No one cares about me. Now, I can honestly tell you in 26 years, we have never felt that way. We love you, and I want you to know we believe in you, and we're going to see God continue to do amazing things, and he's going to blow our minds with this 2020 vision. It's going to be great. I'll let you get home. Tim, thank you. We love you all very much. Stay right up here. Guys, gather around. We just want to, we're going to pray for them, and then we'll have them come down here. And as you leave today, just come around and give them a hug and tell them how much you love them. But let's, let's go ahead and stand up and stretch your hands towards them as we pray for them today. Father, first, we just thank you for these wonderful people. God, I thank you for Pastor and Kathy. God, I thank you for their commitment and their loyalty and their faithfulness to this church, Father. God, we all have been around enough to know that through the years there had to have been times when their thoughts of the vision that they had for this city and for this church were challenged, where the devil tried to run them off, where the devil tried to intimidate them with fear. But, Lord, they always stood the test. They always stuck around. They always stayed. And we admire them for their loyalty and their commitment to this community. And God, as we head into this new season of the ministry, and if you, would, if you were Terry and we were to see the year 2020 come to pass, 
and we look at this vision that, has, that you have given them for this church and for this community. God, we pray that in these coming months and this next year or two that there be a greater anointing than ever before, Father. God, these people work hard, Father, and we can't do anything to, to earn the anointing, but we can work so hard, Father, to where the Holy Spirit will feel compelled to anoint this place. Lord, I pray for every sermon that they'll preach in the coming months and years to prep us and get us ready to make a life-changing uh, impact in this community, Father. We pray that you'll anoint every sermon. We pray for every planning meeting, everything that they do. Let every part of their hands at work, Father, be blessed by you and be anointed by your Holy Spirit. And God, we pray personally for them for health in their bodies. We pray that the devil will never get a foothold in that. We pray their bodies would always be properly lined up with the Word of God, that we'll never have to worry about sickness and disease coming upon their lives, Father. We rebuke it in Jesus' name. We know that's not your will for their lives. Let them be healthy and whole, Father. Young and vibrant for the rest of their ministry. And Lord, I pray there'll be a multiplication of their gifts as well, Father. The things you bless them with, Lord, let them multiply in the future, Father. Let them be more talented, more gifted. Let their, with the great attitudes they have, increase their aptitude to do more than they ever thought that they could do, Father. And Lord, we just ask you to bless them today. Let them know how much we love and appreciate them. And we thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.